Now, my name is Damon Porter, and I'm professor of history at Charleston Southern University, as well as the Citadel. And I've been right, and I've written three books on African American history that are available for you tonight. And needs to say, I am very happy to see you folks here. And I hope that the heat, the, that the, it gets cool enough for y'all. But you're here to hear some interesting information that you will not hear anywhere else. I've spent many years going through old archives and old libraries and uh, interviews with elderly people to find things that are not often told elsewhere. And it's reflected in these, book, in these, in these books. So tonight I'm going to tell you about not only Juneteenth, but what happened, an important story of what happened afterwards that's often forgotten or not told today. Now, with that said, let me proceed. You see, Juneteenth had its beginning when Juneteenth had its beginning when after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it only freed the slaves in areas that were rebelling against the Union. States who still had slavery but were not part of the Confederacy, like Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, were not affected by it. But it achieved its desired result because African Americans all over the South started just running off from the plantations once they heard that they were free, and many of them joined the Union Army, which was the desired result, and literally fought for their freedom. So as the Civil War came to an end, Lincoln knew that he needs, that, thanks to his negotiations with the great freedom fighter, Frederick Douglass, he knew that he needed something stronger than that. So the 13th Amendment was passed that basically ended slavery throughout the United States. But shortly before his death, he made a speech in Washington, D.C., April the 11th, 1865, where he, where he said that he was in favor of, quote, letting the, using the language of that day, letting the intelligent Negroes and those who fought for their freedom in the Union Army vote. And when he said that, there was a man in the audience by the name of John Wilkes Booth who did not appreciate that in the least. So three days later, the Civil War is over. Lincoln decides to go on a night on the town with his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. And they go to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. to watch a play called Our American Cousin. But at the play that night, the bodyguard was supposed to be outside making sure that nobody got in to bother the Lincolns was enjoying the laughter of the place so much that he went inside and sat next to the Lincolns and deserted his post. That's when John Wilkes Booth climbed up there and shot him to death. And the thing was that when Lincoln made that speech on April the 11th, 1865, he had his plans for this thing called the Reconstruction Era, which is now that the war is over and slavery on paper is dead, what do we do next? But he was killed before he could fully develop that. Now, there was a Union general named Gordon Granger who came down to Galveston, Texas on June the 19th, 1865. And he found that many of the African Americans down there did not know that they were yet free. And so he, so he read the proclamation to them, and they were like, what? And so they celebrated. And every year since then, on June the 19th, African Americans in Texas celebrated Juneteenth to commemorate their freedom. And as the black people in Texas went throughout the country due to wars, due to moving to different places and so forth, they took Juneteenth with them, which is why we know about it here in South Carolina today. Now, the pro what most people don't know is what happened next. And that's what I'm here to tell you. You see, they had this thing called Reconstruction. That meant that there were these three constitutional amendments. The 13th that said that they were legally free. The 14th that said that they were citizens. And the 15th that said that they could vote. And so throughout the South, conventions were held in the various cities where they rewrote the constitutions of their states to end slavery and bring about a new era of freedom, justice, and equality. And that's what I'm going to talk to you all about tonight, folks. The path not taken. You're, you're good. You're good. Now, from, from June, from January to April 1865, 
right here in Charleston, as they did in many other southern states, they had a constitutional convention over at where the federal courthouse is today on Broad and Meeting Streets. 76 blacks and 48 sympathetic whites came together to turn South Carolina into the democracy it never had. They, they were going to pass a new order in which the power went from just the hands of a handful of wealthy whites to blacks as well as poor whites. And they worked on a new convention, a new constitution, to bring about that new order. And it was from the records of this that's in the Charleston County Library in the South Carolina Rooms Archives that I got the information that I'm going to tell you now that has often not been placed in school books. These are the first African Americans who went to Congress during Reconstruction. Among them, this is Hiram Rebels of Mississippi, Benjamin Turner of Alabama, Jefferson Long of Florida, uh, J Robert DeLarge of Charleston, uh, Joseph Rainey of Georgetown, and a brilliant man by the name of Robert Brown Elliott, who had a law office on Broad Street along with William J. Whipper, who's the great-great-grandfather of Seth Whipper, who's now a magistrate in Charleston. And these men were educated, elegant men of eloquence. When we think of slavery and black people in those days, we often think of ignorance and illiteracy. Well, tonight, you're going to see the real side of that story. This is the great Robert Smalls from Beaufort, South Carolina. Most of you have probably heard the story of how he, uh, he, he and his family stealed aboard, stealed aboard the Confederate ship, the Planner, and how they sailed into freedom in Charleston Harbor. That's the story about Robert Smalls that most people know. Here's the story that most people don't know. After he sailed his way and his family into freedom, he learned to read and write and became a very eloquent man. And he was one of the 76 blacks and 48 whites who attended that convention here in Charleston. And he made history on January the 23rd, 1868, where he put these words in our state constitution. Resolved that for the purpose of making effective the common school system, it be required that all parents and guardians send their children between the ages of 7 and 14 to some school at least six months for each year under penalties for noncompliance to be fixed by law. You see, Robert Smalls was the man behind the creation of the public school system of South Carolina. Because up to that point, the only people who were educated in South Carolina were a handful, handful of wealthy white males. If you were rich and a female, you would be sent to a finishing school. But everybody else suffered in illiteracy. And he was the main one that started the wheels in motion to try to put a stop to that. This is Benjamin Franklin Randolph from Pennsylvania, who came down here during the Civil War as a U.S. Army chaplain. He was a member of the South Carolina Senate and from this uh, delegation from or representing Orangeburg, South Carolina. He put this in the state constitution on February 12, 1868. Distinction on account of race and color or in any case whatever shall be prohibited and all classes and citizens, irrespective of race and color, shall enjoy all common, equal, and political privileges. In our Bill of Rights, I want to settle the question forever by making the meaning so plain that a wavering man, though a fool, cannot misunderstand it. Let that sink in. <laughs> this is Francis Cardoso. Anybody here got family in Washington, D.C.? If you have folks in D.C., you've heard of Cardozo High School, which was Marvin Gaye's alma mater. He's the namesake. He was, born, he was born here in Charleston. His father was a Jewish merchant and his mother was a slave. And he was the founding principal of the Avery Institute, which some of y'all know was a black school in Charleston back in the day, and now it's a museum and library. And he was the first African-American elected to statewide office. He was the Secretary of State and the Treasurer of South Carolina doing Reconstruction. And believe it or not, he also attended the University of South Carolina for a time being, and I'll get more on that a little bit later. But he said this in the state constitution. Before we get into that, 
the University of South Carolina, notice this, these students here. These were students at the University of South Carolina at Columbia from 1873 to 1877. Guess what? That school was integrated. The University of South Carolina in Columbia and Berea College in Kentucky were the only colleges in the South during this period where both blacks and whites attended as students. Anybody here from Columbia? Okay, anybody here familiar with Columbia? Okay, some of you might remember Saxon Holmes, the projects over by Benedict where uh, the comedian J. Anthony Brown and the singer Angie Stone are from. This is Celia Dial Saxton, who was a graduate of that school, the University of South Carolina at that time period, who became one of the first prominent black teachers in Columbia, as a matter of fact. But yes, it was in a great for a time from 1873 to 1877. And this poster can be found at various locations at USC today. My alma mater, I might add, class of 87. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Francis Cardozo said this. It is a patent fact that as colored men, we have been cheated out of our rights for two centuries. And now that we have the opportunity, I want to fix it in the Constitution in such a way that no lawyer, however cunning or astute, could possibly misinterpret the meaning. If we do not do so, we deserve to be and will be cheated again. Nearly all the white inhabitants of our state are ready at any moment to deprive us of these rights and not a loophole should be left that would permit them to do it constitutionally. Not one of them scarcely was in favor of this convention, and as soon as they had the power, whether by election of a Democratic president or an increase in immigration, they would endeavor to overthrow this constitution. Hence, while they, the constitution, had a chance to do it, by all means, let us insert these words without distinction of race or color, wherever it was necessary to give force and clearance to their purpose. You see, 96 years before John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson wrote the Civil Rights Act of, the, of 1964. This gentleman, Francis Cardozo, put this in the South Carolina Constitution on February 12, 1868. This is Jonathan Jasper Wright. He was the vice president of the convention. He was the actual, now today, the Supreme Court Justice of South Carolina is a man named Don Bader from my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, I might add. But anyway, before him, there was Ernest Finney, and before them, there was Jonathan Jasper Wright in the 1870s at Calvary Episcopal Cemetery in 107 Lime Street. That's where he's buried today. Well, what did he have to do with this, along with being the vice president of the convention? He said these words. In this Constitution, we have made it a matter of impossibility for the courts of the state to imprison a man of death. We have considered imprisonment for death to be a relic of barbarism. We decided to deprive the legislature of the power to imprison a man for death. There is no way the legislature can compel a man to pay his capitation tax and no way to make him work upon the streets our public works of a criminal. Why, what way should we devise then for the payment of the poll tax? We must instill into the minds and the hearts of the people the sacredness of the ballot box. The people must be taught that the votes they hold in their hands are their only great defense of the rights and privileges which God has granted to man. He said that on March the 4th, 1868. Now I want y'all to stop for a moment. Listen to the articulate, eloquent language of these men. Some fresh out of slavery, many who were free, and a good many who are educated. Listen to this eloquent language and compare that to a lot of the political dialogue today. Let that sink in. Sure. This is William J. Wick, who was the law partner of Robert Brown Elliott on, a line, on a Broad Street in Charleston during the uh, 1870s. He was the delegate to the South Carolina Constitution Conventions of 1868 and again in 1895. He said that, now this is what he said in regards to women. <clears throat> Whatever it be done or not, however lightly the subject may be treated, however frivolous you may think it, I tell you that I know that the time will come when every man and woman in this country will have the right to vote. I acknowledge the superiority of women. They are large numbers. <laughs> There are large numbers of the sex who have an intelligence more than equal to our own. And I ask, is it right or just to deprive these intelligent beings 
of the privileges we now enjoy. Think about this, folks. He said this in favor of women having the right to vote on March the 9th, 1868. That was 52 years before the Constitution of the United States allowed women the right to vote. But even that, well, as radical as this convention was, even that was too radical for the vast majority of members of it. So in 1868, they didn't pass that. But at least, you know, it was put on the table. Now here's another great guy, Alonzo Jacob Ramsey. He was a Haitian American from um, Pitt Street in downtown Charleston. Guess what? During this Reconstruction period, he was the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina from 1870 to 1872. And one of my students in the rear, uh, Yasmin Nash, is at the Charleston Southern University. The librarian at Charleston Southern University is a lady named Linda Rousseau. That's his great-great-granddaughter. He said something that was very prophetic in all of this. And speaking of the Confederacy, when the masses of poor whites fought for the rights of wealthy whites to own slaves, he said these words, and I want y'all to really let this sink in. If there is any one thing to which we may attribute the suffering endured by this people, it is the gross ignorance of the masses. And that was what the argument that he used to get the, uh, the bill for public schools in South Carolina passed. Because he felt that they got into that mess in the first place, i.e. the Confederacy and the loss from it, because the masses of people were ignorant enough to be fooled by their leaders and fighting about it. So he felt that if the people were educated, they would have better sense and pick better leaders to make a better future. <laughs> you may continue. Okay. He, now, not too long after that, remember I told you about Benjamin Franklin Randolph? Well, he went to speak in Abbeville later in 1868. And he was assassinated by a members of a group that was formed in Pulaski, Tennessee on uh, December 24th, 1865. There were six Confederate veterans led by Captain John Lester, and they formed a new organization to combat these type of things. They took the Greek name for circle, which is Ku Klux. That's K-O, that's, K that's K-U-K-L-O-S. And they took the Scottish word for family, which is clan. And ladies and gentlemen, you thus had the? Very good. And they went buck wild with violence throughout the South. Now, however, as we will see, uh, sometimes the African Americans gave as good as they got. Another untold story. But I digress. Anyway, after Benjamin Randolph was assassinated, Alonzo J. Ranzier said these words. I know there are times where forbearance ceases to be a virtue. I share with you the feeling of indignation which uncontrolled would lead me to seek vengeance by retaliation, but bear and forbear. The day of our political deliverance is at hand. Let not these outrages intimidate you to lead you to measures of retaliation by which possibly the innocent may suffer along with the guilty. He said that in Charleston News and Courier, October 22, 1868. This was the second, excuse me, black lieutenant governor of South Carolina, Richard Gleaves. He served from 1872 to 1877 after Alonzo Ramsey. I should also add that the governor that he served under was Franklin Jacob Moses. Franklin J. Moses was the first Jewish governor of South Carolina, which meant that South Carolina is the only state in American history where you had a Jewish governor and a black lieutenant governor. And it was under those men that the University of South Carolina and the State National Guard became integrated. And this is my man, Reverend Richard Harvey King. Any of y'all heard of Lincolnville? He was the founder. Not only that, but after the Civil War ended, he came down here. He was born in Greenbrier, West Virginia, and he pastored in Brooklyn. And he came down here after the Confederacy ended, and he picked up the remnants of a church that was called the Hempstead AME Church, and he rechristened them. He named them after the Hebrew word for God is with us, which is 
Emmanuel, and it would be the mother of the new black churches in Charleston. He found the mother Emmanuel. And he also was a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives from 1870 to 1875 and 1877 to 1879. And he was spoken in the House of Representatives also. But then here comes the guy who starts the downward spiral in all of this. Benjamin Ryan Tillman, the architect of Jim Crow and South, the Jim Crow laws of South Carolina. Now, uh, he also, by the way, his um, lawyer and campaign manager was a gentleman by the name from Edgefield, also by from Edgefield, by the name of William. William Thurman, whose son became the longest serving senator in South Carolina history. Strong argument. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Tillman was the architect of the Hamburg Massacre, one of the people who was involved with the Hamburg Massacre. Mm -hmm where African Americans who were um, drilling a military unit, they got an altercation with the former Confederate general, and the general went back and got a group called the Sweetwater Sable Club, which was a Klan offshoot. And one of the leaders of that was Benjamin Tillman, and they massacred African Americans in what's known as the Hamburg Riot or the Hamburg Massacre in July of 1876. And, uh, well, you see what they had to say about this in the cartoons of the time, rather uh, politically incorrect language. We're talking 1876 here. By the way, Hamburg is what's today known as um, North Augusta. But not too long after that, a group of African Americans shot up a group of uh, whites at a political meeting in King Roy, South Carolina, in retaliation. So the state was pretty much a bloodbath at this point. Well, Richard Harvey King, when he heard of the Hamburg Massacre, he marched a 1,000 black people down to the old uh, city market on South Market Street. And as they marched through, a lot of the white people were like, whoa, what is this? And the police were about to arrest a black boy on an unknown charge. And the crowd following Reverend Richard Harvey King said, this ain't Hamburg. This ain't Hamburg. This ain't Hamburg. The police let the kid go. <laughs> and Reverend Richard Harvey King got up and said these words for all to hear. We tell you that it will not do to go too far with this thing. Remember that there are 80,000 black men in the state who can bear Winchester rifles and know how to use them. That, that there are 200,000 women who can light a torch and use the knife. And there are 100,000 boys and girls who have not known the lash of a white master, who have tasted freedom once and forever and that there's a deep determination never, so help their God, to submit to be shot down by lawless regulators for no crimes committed against society and law. There's a point where forbearance ceases to be a virtue. Cowards driven to desperation often destroy those who corner them. The Negro in this country will not always be docile. He will not always be restrained by his law-abiding character. The rising generation are as brave and as daring as white men. And already that spirit is taking deep roots in the minds of thousands who have nothing to lose in the contest and who would rejoice at the opportunity to sacrifice their lives for their liberty, Reverend Richard Harvey King, Ju July the 17th, 1876. So then came the Tilden Hayes Compromise of 1876. When there was an election that year that had race riots throughout the South as African Americans voted. And because of the election, the results came incomplete with uh, the votes. And there were three states in dispute, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. <laughs> Sound familiar? Always oh, Florida. So the Electoral College met at the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. on February 22, 1877 to figure out who won the election, the Democrat, Samuel Tilden, or the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes. Well, the South went and said this, we will give you the delegates, the Electoral College, for Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, if you agree to take the federal troops out of the South and allow us to handle our affairs as we see fit. So in the 
presidential election of 1876 as a result of this compromise, the Democrat Samuel Tilden won the popular vote, but because of the compromise, the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes won the Electoral College and thus became president. Yeah, in a way. Now, this is our great grandfather, J.B. Maxwell, James Buchanan Maxwell. And, you know, he's a real legend where we're from. You know, we grew up hearing stories of this man. And I have to say this thanks to her research, we found that a lot of it was true. Uh, he was a black notary public, and my mother used to always tell me, J.B. was voting when other black people weren't in South Carolina. <laughs> And he was an ex-slave. He was born in Flat Rock, North Carolina, and died in 1940 when my mother was a teenager. And he was the first black notary public of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And he was an 1873 graduate of the Avery Institute, along with John Dart, who was the founder of the Dart Library in Charleston. And that's him, because she found a group of pictures and sent them to me. And so I put this up here, along with the following information. On November 12, 1879, our great-grandfather was taken to court on a trumped-up charge of voting while illiterate, one of the ways they tried to curb the black vote in the days. And uh, the lawyer in this case, I can barely see his name on this, was going to give him the business trying to make him look like he was silly because they thought he was actually illiterate. But so they're like, can you read? And he said, he got up and said as loud as he could, I can read. Over and over, he said, I can read. And the judge is like, you know, banging on the gavel and all of that. And when they saw he was nothing to mess with, they left him alone. And so she found this uh, transcript, which I just gave you that information from just now. It's a treasured place in my family, and it's going to be in my, and the story behind that's going to be in my next book, American Storyteller, a novel of folklore, which should be out sometime next year. But then, with all of this, um, the South began to beat back the car of African American progress. They posted big cartoons like this. You see the black demon with the words Negro rule on it and things like that. And state by state began to restrict the uh, rights of black people to vote. South Carolina had a constitutional convention in, uh, 1870, in 1895 when Benjamin Tillman became the senator where they reversed the 1868 Constitution and they made the Jim Crow Constitution, which denied black people of their voting rights and made segregation the law of the state, just as Francis Cardozo had predicted. Tillman said this in the US Senate, as white men, we're not sorry for it, and we do not propose to apologize for anything we have done in connection with it. We took the government away from them in 1876. We did not disfranchise the Negroes until 1895. Then we had a constitutional convention convened, which took up the matter calmly, deliberately, and so forth. And he go goes on to say that uh, we of the South never re recognized the right of the Negro to govern the white man, and we never will. We have never believed him to be equal to the white man, and we will not submit him to gratifying his lust on our wives and daughters without lynching him. I look to God that every last one of them was in Africa and that none of them had been brought to our shores. Benjamin Tillman said this to Congress <coughs> on March the 23rd, 1900. But one part of that story that is not often told is that at the Constitutional Convention of 1895, they were uh, 154 white, there were 156 whites and six blacks remaining as representatives. They were uh, James Wig of Beaufort, Isaiah Reed of Beaufort, Thomas Miller, the founder of South Carolina State, William J. Whipper, uh, Robert Anderson of Georgetown, and the great Robert Smalls. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you this. There were two white delegates, T.E. Dudley of Marlboro, South Carolina, and uh, J. Halston Reed of Georgetown, who refused to go along with the rest of the white delegates because they said that that would bring the wrath of the federal government down on them. And the great Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee University, 
had an open letter to Senator Tillman where he said, Senator, if you think it is expensive to educate the Negro, imagine how worse it would be if he were to remain in ignorance. Mm -hmm. And so this did not go out without a fight. And Robert and William H. Whipper closed that, closed that convention with these words to Benjamin Tillman. This convention is making a great mistake in not giving the Negro latitude. The car of Negro progress is coming. And instead of allowing it to come on, you wish to stop it. You might as well make up your minds that the Negro will rise. He will not be crushed. The Negro will rise. Sooner or later, crush us as you may. The Negro, with his perseverance and pluck, will and must come out. He cannot be kept down forever. It is not the nature of human affairs. William J. Whipper said these words on November the 1st, 1865. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, long before Dr. King, President Obama, and all these other people, you had people like this out there with brave words and brave deeds, doing these type of things, keeping up the good fight, and not losing the faith. But you see, the history books have conveniently left a lot of this stuff out. But there are those of us who love to do research, who go deep down in the archives, and our job is to bring this information to you, to let you know that there was a time that even in these dark days, people reached out across the aisle to each other and they formed coalitions. They spoke with eloquence. They laid the, bl the blueprint of the civil rights struggles to come. And the thing about stuff like that to understand is that people who did great things like that at that time could also do them again. All they have to do is get the instructions and learn how it was done then. And I want to close on this note. In the midst of this despair, right off after all of that, Booker T. Washington was going to speak at a school in Jacksonville, Florida. And there was a man at the school who invited him by the name of James Weldon Johnson. And he, like many other African Americans and well-meaning whites of that time, felt the despair of the rise of power like people like Tillman, who was bringing all this misery to the African Americans and so forth. And he wanted to not just have Booker T. Washington speak there, but he wanted to write something that would inspire the students. So he got together and he started thinking about all of these things and he came up with this brilliant poem that he set to music that was first played at that occasion that went like this. Okay, that was in the 14th Amendment in 1868 that overturned the idea from um, the Dred Scott decision that said that the quote Negro had no rights that white people ought to respect. That was overturned by on paper by the 14th Amendment. The problem was that the 14th and 15th Amendments were not seriously enforced until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
And the whole idea, really, behind the Civil Rights Movement was to get them to enforce what they already had on the paper all along. As Dr. King himself said in his last speech in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, April 3rd, 18, 1968, be true to what you said on paper. And that's what it was all about. As you guys leave, I want to thank you all again for, for coming. Um, uh, I will see all, most of you on Saturday at Woodland um, High School. Um, please come in and use the library. I'm trying to bring some great programming here for our uh, um, you know, community. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on, and I'll have some booklets at Woodland High School um, for you all to look at on Saturday, right? Okay.